welcome to today's Tuesday tip. As I mentioned last Tuesday, Tuesday before last, I was out and we didn't have a tip because I was on property doing MORs. I want to share with you some of the things that I found while I was on property doing MORs, just in case you're getting ready for one. First of all, you have to run the EID existing tenant search on the dependents. I went to three properties while I was out, and on all three of the properties, they have the same common finding. You have to run the existing tenant search on everyone that's in the household, and that's so that HUD can make sure they're not paying double subsidy. A lot of managers just want to run it on the head of the household, but the word is on who? Everyone. You have to run it on everyone that's in the household. That was the most common that I found on the three properties. The other thing that I found was that on the 9887A, that's the form that tells you to print the person's name, the resident's name, and then have them to sign it and management has to print their name and position and sign the form also. A lot of you were not signing or were not dating the form. Remember that because we use EIV, the 9887 and the 9887A has to be signed and dated. The 9887 needs to be signed and dated by the resident. The 9887A needs to be signed and dated by the resident and by the management or the owner agent. So make sure that you're doing that. The other thing with the 9887 form was at the top. There are three boxes at the top, and we've talked about this before. One is for the HUD office. The other one is for the management company. And the third one is for the contract administrator, whether it's a traditional contract administrator or whether it's a contract administrator like Navigate. Those three boxes have to be completed because if you will read the 9887, the first line tells the resident not to sign the form if the three blocks are not completed. And HUD tells us that if the resident doesn't sign the 9887 and the 9887A, that they can't participate in the program. HUD also tells us before we pull any EIV information, we have to make sure that we have the 9887 and the 9887A signed, dated, and in the file. So don't get caught up on that one. I'm going to share several with you. Today, I'm just going to do four. Next week, I will do four more. So the third most common finding that I found while I was out on property is that the residents have assets, but sometimes our residents don't know what assets are. If you have a good application form and it lists what assets are, that's great. It gives them a better understanding as to what an asset may be. However, while I was out on the 5059, the asset portion of the 59 was left blank. There was nothing there. But I found that there were residents who were receiving Social Security. Now, Social Security grandfathered a few people in to get paper checks. There are not many people who get paper Social Security checks anymore. So if your resident does, you need to make a note to the file and have an affidavit from the resident that he or she receives a paper Social Security check. Otherwise, you should have some type of asset listed on the 59 under assets. It could be the resident's checking or savings account. If they don't have a personal checking or savings account, then Social Security is sending it on the Direct Express debit card. But if they have this debit card, HUD tells us to treat it like a savings account and get the current balance at the time of certification. So make sure that you're putting something for asset. One of the managers told me when we were doing the exit interview, well, they only had a dollar in there. My response was, HUD doesn't say how much has to be in there. 
they say that you have to acknowledge that there is an asset. So if it has zero in that account when they verify it, you still list it on your 5-9 as an asset. Now, the fourth thing that I found, of course, was EIV. That's an issue all within itself. But let me just say that you have to run the reports. You have to run the EIV reports according to your own EIV policies and procedures. I found several EIV findings, but most of all, I found that a lot of managers were not running them according to what their written EIV policy says. So we want to be careful of that. Well, thanks again for tuning in for today's Tuesday Tip, and I'll see you next week on Tuesday Tips. Did you like this video? Hit the like button below. Do you want to see more content just like this? Be sure to subscribe to all our social media platforms. And if you know someone who could really use this information, be sure to share it.